Uh, welcome to the Investor Download. My name's David Brett and joining me in the studio today is a very, very special guest who some might say has our future in his hands. He is the CEO of National Grid, one of the world's largest publicly listed utilities, which by way of channeling electricity and gas around the country, manages to keep houses warm, computers on and factories turning over. He's John Pettigrew. John, welcome to the show. Hello. Um, hope I didn't put too much pressure on you with that intro. <laughs> <Not at all. laughs> you don't look too nervous anyway. Uh, for those who not who might not know you, can you just tell us a bit about your journey with National Grid? Oh, so actually, I joined National Grid as a graduate back in 1991. So I've been with the company for 32 years, well, <laughs> which, if I'm honest, when I started, that wasn't the plan. You know, I thought I'd um, the, the industry had just been privatised following Margaret Thatcher's um, decision on that. I thought it'd be quite interesting to get involved in the energy sector. I come from South Wales, which is a mining community. So it seemed like a good place to start my career, but actually I've been very lucky and have had fantastic opportunities with National Grid and have stayed for 32 years. I was going to say there, there can't be too many people who've walked into a company as 21-year-old and think I'm going to be CEO in a few years' time. No, I never thought I'd be CEO <laughs> when I was 21. If I'm honest, I don't think I knew what a CEO did when I was 21, <laughs> but, but I am you know, very privileged to be the CEO of National Grid today. And can you give us a, also a little bit of background about National Grid? Because it's not just... I'm I mean, you're mainly based in the UK, but you also have got uh, interests abroad as well. Yeah, so people don't follow National Grid. I think think of National Grid as a UK company, but actually over the last 20 years or so, uh, we've acquired a number of companies in the US. So broadly, National Grid is 50% UK, 50% US. So in the UK, we're predominantly an electricity networks business. So we transport electricity um, across the network. Um, so we've got an electricity transmission business, a distribution business, and we've also connect the UK to Europe, and we've got these interconnectors as well, which we can talk about. And in the US, we're predominantly focused in the Northeast, where we serve about 20 million people. Okay, so I was being a little bit hyperbolic, saying you have our future in our hands, but given our energy security issues, the cost of living crisis, and obviously climate change, some of the projects your company is involved with uh, go in some way to solving all three of those problems. Uh, I just wondered how aware you and your teams are of that when you're encountering these projects. Yeah, I think there's a, a real sense of purpose at National Grid. So, um, in fact, when we recruit people these days, what people ask about National Grid is, is about the future, about what's the role that we're playing in the energy transition and what we're doing to mitigate climate change. And, you know, the whole organization feels a real sense of pride. So today we're keeping the lights on, we're keeping the gas flowing, but we're also building the infrastructure for tomorrow, which will actually enable the energy transition. And, you know, it's, it's fundamental. It's, it's the biggest change in the energy sector that we've seen in a generation plus. Hey, that's impressive that the energy transition message has actually got out that far. It absolutely has. It's, um, you know, when we're looking to attract people, it's one of the big, the key things that attracts people today. Okay, so we're here to tell a story actually about the re rewiring of the economy, uh, something which is going on largely out the sight of the general public, and a lot of it is happening many, many metres below the ground. These infrastructure projects are massive, and they're not just a UK story, they're a global story, and they're being done to safeguard and future-proof our power grids. They require billions of dollars of investment, both public and private. So with that in mind, we've also got an investor on the show. Uh, we have Schroeder's fund manager, Ashley Thomas. Ashley, welcome to the show. Thank you. Uh, now, Ashley, you've been to visit one of National Grid's projects many, many metres below the streets of London. Um, I've seen your video of the visit, but what was your experience like? Yeah, I went to see uh, the second phase of the London Power Tunnels project. Um, and it's really quite remarkable, actually, because it's, it's a major upgrade of the London electricity network, um, in total around £2 billion. And uh, for a, a large capital investment programme, uh, and I'll look at uh, John here to make sure it's still the case. It's it's uh, on time and, and potentially <laughs> <laughs> potentially even uh, uh, un under budget. Um, and um, you know, rather than um, replace the existing cable networks, which are a few meters a few meters uh, below the ground and would create uh, a lot of disruption, um, a, uh, a network of tunnels um, housing. Um, uh, a new uh, higher voltage um, power cable network uh, has been placed uh, under under London um, and um, it will future proof London's electricity needs. Um, so for me, it was quite remarkable. The entrance of the site that I went to, the uh, the head house and the tunnel shaft uh, was in the Old Kent Road. And I saw uh, an old Victorian era gas holder that had been there uh, for over 100 years 
um, and had only been um, decommissioned in the past 20 years. And actually, when I look at uh, the London Power Tunnels, you know, it has the potential and should have the ability to, to, to be there and last similarly for, for another century. Excellent. John? On time and under budget, that doesn't sound like something that usually goes on in London when it comes to huge projects. Well, I think one of the things that we're really proud of, actually, or my engineering team are really proud of, is just we spend a huge amount of time in the planning phase. So um, we're developing the network for the future, and therefore each of these projects is multi-year. Uh, but quite often they're in local communities, and therefore we have to make sure that we engage the local communities and we construct it in a way that doesn't impact too much on their lives. So a huge amount of planning, um, which means that when we get to the construction phase, then if we've done it right, then we should deliver them on time and hopefully below budget. Okay, so uh, now one of the main reasons, although not the only reasons this has all been done is because of climate change and the need to uh, transition from uh, dirty to clean power. And we've had a lot of commitments over the last few years from many different countries in regards to meeting those climate targets, in particular decarbonisation. Uh, so to keep things sim simple, we're going to concentrate on the UK to begin with, which has a target to decarbonise the power sector by 2035, potentially 2030 for the Labour Party, uh, which would see electricity demand increase by 50%. Uh, can you describe what it's going to take uh, from a infrastructure term in terms of building to meet those targets? Yeah, so, you know, it's not an exaggeration to say from an infrastructure perspective, it is the biggest build out of the networks since Victorian times. Um, you know, most of our networks were built in the 1960s where we were, we were basically transporting energy from the north of the country where the coal mines were to the south of the country where most of the population is. And what we're having to do is to rewire Britain so that actually all the energy is coming in from the North Sea through offshore wind and from the, uh, the Celtic Sea. So it means we have to reconfigure the whole system. But on top of that, the network is expanding into the sea. <laughs> so my 17 largest projects are all related to connecting 50 gigawatts of offshore wind by 2030. So not only are we having to rebuild the network onshore, but we're having to think about the network offshore as well, which, um, you know, in the North Sea will be the most sophisticated transmission system in the world. I was going to say that sounds terribly complicated. Yeah, I mean, we, we were looking at our investment plans and actually probably half of our investment in transmission in the next decade is going to be offshore rather than onshore. Okay, so that actually leads me to my next question. Um, that sounds like a lot of money uh, that's going to go into this. Um, and as a consumer of electricity, I presume some of that cost is going to be picked up by people like me, uh, just the general public. How much is it going to cost us? Yeah, so ultimately, um, it's probably worth putting into context. So, you know, typically today, a domestic household is paying around £2,000 a year for their energy bill. The national grid transmission bit of that bill, the electricity transmission bill, is £22.22. 22 pence. Because we build these assets and they last, as Ashley said, for many, many years, you spread the cost over a very long period of time. So even though the amount that we're going to spend on these networks is in the tens of billions over the next few decades, actually the cost to the consumer is actually relatively modest. And if we get it right and you believe that technology prices for renewables are going to come down and be cheaper than fossil fuels and actually remove some of that exposure that we've had and we've seen you know, in the last couple of years with the Russian-Ukraine is, uh, issues, then actually the total bill for consumers should come down. So although the cost of networks will go up, actually the total cost to consumers should go down over time. Okay, and my next question is, because it sounds like a huge project and in a relatively short space, like you were saying, the last build was in Victorian times. We're now looking to try and change everything in around about 10, 15 years, depending on the timeline. How achievable is it? Well, I'd say the targets are massively ambitious. I mean, National Grid a, a month or so ago, uh, trying to be helpful, actually, set out uh, where we see that there needs to be changes in sort of government policy and regulation to actually at least have a fighting chance of meeting these targets. So to give you one example, we talked about planning reform in the UK. So today to build a single transmission line, so we're building one down in, um, in Somerset to connect the Hinkley Sea nuclear power station. The planning process took seven years and the construction phase takes two to three years. Yeah. So to build a single transmission line takes about 10 years. So unless we can find a way of streamlining the planning process, uh, and we need to do it in a way that is you know, very sympathetic to local communities that are going to host that infrastructure, but unless we can reduce that timescale, 
then it's going to be incredibly difficult to hit a 20, 30 timescale when it takes 10 years to build a single transmission line. Which brings us nicely on to what are the obstacles, both politically and practically, that you've encountered along the way? Yeah, so as well as um, planning, I mean, uh, and we're having conversations with the regulator around how do you create a regulatory regime that allows you to invest in advance of need? So the reality is that infrastructure like uh, transmission takes longer than it takes to build a solar or wind farm. Um, so one of the things we've been advocating for is actually why don't we, we know that the energy transition is happening. It's not uncertain. And we know that governments want to uh, address climate change. So why don't we build out the infrastructure in advance? So National Grid um, is in the US and we're currently bidding into New Jersey to connect some offshore wind farms. Now, New Jersey's already done the transmission investment onshore and is telling us exactly where the offshore needs to connect. In the UK, anybody can connect anywhere and then you have to go and build infrastructure. So we think there's a real opportunity to change the regulatory framework to say, we know it's happening, so let's get on with it and let's build the capacity. And then when people come along, they can plug in effectively into the network. Yeah, properly fu future-proofing, right? Properly future-proofing. Sounds sensible. <laughs> hopefully, hopefully it all works out. Okay, so the UK electricity grid, in fact, many grids around the world, including Europe and US, already seem to be struggling to cope with this energy transition. New grid connection dates can be out to the mid-2030s. Uh, the cost of curtailing excess wind generation is increasing and governments and regulators are asking coal or gas plants to remain on the system for backup. Uh, what well, We touched on there. What changes to the design or operation of the grid do you think needs to take place for this transition to be better managed? Yeah, so two things, really. So first of all, just to put it into context, uh, if I look at the UK today, we've got something like 320 gigawatts of generation that says they want to connect to the network in the next decade. Now, the network today, the peak demand in the winter in the UK is about 60 gigawatts. Oh, wow. Even when it increases by 50% by 2035, it's about 90 gigawatts. So we've probably got about three times more people saying they want to connect than actually need to connect to meet the targets that have been set. Um, and actually, when we look back historically, typically about 60% of people say they're going to build something out and, and connect don't. So one of the things we've been talking to the regulator about is just changing the process. We've got all these projects in the queue that actually will never happen, but they get in the way of the ones that are going to happen. Mm -hmm. So we've been advocating to change that. So we don't have a capacity issue. What we have is a sequencing issue. Uh, and we need to clear out those, and I think Jonathan Brearley was the CEO of Ofgem, called them zombie projects. Get rid of the zombie projects. And then let's make sure we've got the projects that are going to have the biggest impact at the front of the queue and then the second thing would be allow us to invest in advance so that when they do come along, actually they can plug into the system. So those are two things that we've been sort of advocating for, and that will help massively with getting to the targets that have been set. Can I ask a, perhaps a silly question? How do you know something is a zombie project when it comes to you? Uh, well, we don't. That's the problem. So I'll, I'll give you a sense of it. Do you know, it's easier to um, have capacity on the transmission system today with the regulatory environment than it is to build a nightclub in the UK. <laughs> there are less conditions <laughs> We do need needed. a few more nightclubs. So, so. <laughs> and, and it'll probably cost you less, wouldn't yeah. it? To it get costs, you about, costs you about £30,000 yeah. to get a connection yeah. agreement. So actually, it's cheaper and easier than, than actually getting a nightclub built, built. So it's just... So when we stand back from it, being serious, um, you know, we've got projects that have been in the queue for 15 years and every now and again, they'll say, oh, we're not doing it next year, we're doing it the year after. And then they do it again and again. So these projects, they haven't got planning consent, they haven't got financing, they're not progressing them. So we can see that none of the milestones that they said they were going to hit are being hit. Yet at the moment, we can't get them out of the queue. So we need regulatory reform to do that. And as an investor, we try and help from from our side. Obviously, we can only have sort of limited influence, but but we will go through the tech register, the technical register of, of um, uh, people seeking connections. And, and certainly if there's thermal plants on there for, for new uh, uh, connection requests, um, if, if they're listed companies, we will, will engage with them to sort of see, what well, does it make sense? You know, typically they'll be looking for at least a 15-year uh, uh, asset uh, uh, lifetime, you know, sort of, is it really feasible given decarbonisation targets for companies to be seeking to connect unabated gas plant projects? Yeah. 
And what type of responses do you get when you try to engage? Well, the, part of the issue um, is that companies can claim that they are um, uh, CCS ready or hydrogen ready. So technically, they can claim that in the future they can connect. But 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 I think actually that sort of engagement process and, and potentially a, a degree of sort of tough love, um, you know, sort of hopefully will will influence companies to to review. Uh, their connections and and actually, I think National Grid, through its tech amnesty, has had a degree of capacity withdrawn. Yeah, so ex that's exactly right. So, um, so one of the things we did do is say, look, if you're in the queue and you don't really intend to develop it, you can get out of the queue free of charge, no consequences. And we've had about eight gigawatts actually of of generation that's got out of the queue. But we've also started to look at changing our planning processes so that we don't assume that everybody who says they're going to connect is going to connect. And actually, that's freed up about 40 gigawatts. So um, we've got some significant sort of freeing up of capacity, which will, again, accelerate the speed of the energy transition. So people are putting in requests just in case, or they, they may never, yeah. Yeah, okay. exactly. Okay, fair enough. Um, and is there a misalignment between the pace of renewable energy rollout and the investment side of things? Uh, not so much a misalignment. It's just there, there is just a difference in timing. So as I said, if it takes you 10 years to build a transmission line, but it only takes you three years to build a wind farm or a solar farm, then you're always going to have periods where you genuinely have to build capacity because there, you need new capacity. But there's a difference in timing. So that's why we think things like planning reform and anticipatory investment are really important. Okay, I just want to move over to the climate side of things. We've obviously last summer, we had a, a boiling hot summer here in the UK. We had a hottest June as well last month. Uh, we've seen extreme temperatures in Texas over the recent weeks. Uh, that's coming off the back of extreme cold temperatures the year before, which is pushing up this power demand. Is there a risk system modelling isn't taking into account these more extreme technical and climate volatility that we're experiencing at the moment? So I think there would be a risk if, we actually did our forecasting in the way that we've done it in the past, which is to typically to do sort of his, look at historical weather patterns and just project them forward. The reality is that weather patterns are changing. So in the US, we're predominantly in the northeast. There is no doubt that we are seeing more storms and more significant storms in the last decade than we saw in the previous decade. So actually what we do now is a lot of scenario planning. So we work closely we're actually with the Met Office in the UK and the, the similar uh, organizations in the US. And we scenario plan against their advice on what climate change could do to weather patterns. Uh, and then we run that through our models and then we start to think about, well, what mitigations can we do? So um, National Grid's actually got an in-house tool that you can overlay, overlay sort of climate impact onto our assets and it'll tell you what it's going to do in terms of flooding or heating. And then we start to put investment plans around that. So, you know, we'll start to think about which of our substations are sort of low levels and therefore we need to put flooding protection around them. Actually, in the summer, we're starting to think about more cooling for our mm. supergrid transformers because they're getting hotter for longer periods. Um, so those are types of things. And in the US, actually storm hardening, as we call it, which is actually strengthening the network so it can it can withstand much stronger winds are all the sorts of activities that we now do. Uh, you know, ultimately, it's about climate adaptation. So as well as trying to mitigate climate change, you also have to adapt for it. And you know, a lot of the scenario planning we do is around that these days. I suspect a lot of people will be thinking, well, I look at my phone sometimes and I'm looking at the forecast and it's not matching what's going on out there. So can I ask how accurate even the Met's, you know, future modelling is? Yeah, I mean, we don't need to do it pre with precision. Yeah. You know, so what we need to do is decide, you know, what's the one in 100 risk of a flood, uh, a flood alert in a particular part of the world? And then what assets have we got there and what do we need to do? So... Sometimes where the risk is high on the coast, then we actually put permanent solutions in place. We will raise the level of our substations, for example. Some places where the risk is, you know, once in a thousand years, we'll have access to mobile solutions, but we won't put a permanent solution in place. So we don't need to, you know, we're not sort of monitoring it day by day in terms of investment. In terms of operation, in terms of minute by minute as a system operator, then we do look at what's happening minute by minute oh. and we may hold extra reserve, for example, if we're concerned that some generators may fall off because of weather. Um, I asked earlier about potential political obstacles. Uh, in the UK, we recently had the resignation of the MP, Zach Goldsmith. He claimed that the UK government is uninterested in the environment and a progress report uh, to Parliament by the Climate Change Committee claimed Britain has lost leadership in climate action. How do you see the UK's progress in decarbonising? Yeah, so I, 
looking back, I think the UK has got a huge amount to be proud of. So, you know, when I look at other countries uh, around the world, uh, and I look at some of the stats that we have in the UK, you know, so the first quarter of this year, we had more electricity produced from wind than we did from gas. Uh, at the beginning of January, we had a day where 87% of all the electricity in the UK came from zero carbon sources. So we're getting all these records that demonstrate that actually the UK is making pretty good progress. Uh, and things like the, um, the contracts for difference regime really did stimulate offshore wind where the UK is still, I think, you know, leading the world in terms of the volume that we've got and the plans for construction that we've got. I do think though there is a risk that we could lose that that leadership role. Um, you know, in the US where we operate, the Inflation Reduction Act is huge. And I was in Washington recently and you can feel the sort of the excitement that it's brought because I think it's um, $369 billion of subsidy for renewables um, uh, through tax credits and, and other sorts of subsidies. So the industry's sort of got a real pace about it at the moment as people are looking to find ways to invest more quickly. The UK can't compete with that mm. to be a world leader, but where the UK historically I think has been really strong is having the right regulatory and policy environment that's very predictable, very stable, that for the types of assets that we invest in makes it an attractive place. And I think there's an opportunity for the UK government and the regulators to create that environment. So it may not be the cheapest place in the world, but actually it's the easiest place in which to deploy capital, knowing you're going to get a predictable return for the risks that you're taking. And is the main reason the UK can't compete just purely because the sheer size of the US economy. I mean, just the size of the economy. And, and there's a little bit of, you don't all want to be doing the same thing. So, you know, the US economy, for example, is, you know, I think the subsidy on hydrogen is something like $3 a kilogram. It only costs $4 a kilogram. So let the US drive that technology to a point where it's economic. The UK then potentially can, can ride on the back of that with the right sort of regulatory and polit political regime that allows people to invest in it. I guess one of the other issues is, you know, the US hasn't really got a material carbon price. You know, the UK and Europe has, yeah. um, but but still, you know, sort of undeniably, you know, IRA is having a, a, a massive impact. It is indeed, yeah. Yeah. yeah, is carbon pricing affecting things at all? I um, mean, carbon prices obviously is affecting things in terms of the, the overall energy transition. Um, you know, there's always a debate about whether the carbon price is right and whether actually what we're doing is importing the carbon in and we're losing the industry. So all of that is still, I think, up for debate about how would you actually price carbon appropriately across the economy. But it's certainly having a, a, an impact, yeah. Okay, uh, I want to move on to heating, which is obviously vital to businesses and homes. Um, I was reading that the UK, uh, UK home heating is dominated by fossil fuel gas with about 85% or 24.5 million homes heated by natural gas. Uh, what's the best way to decarbonise the heating sector? Yeah, do you know, I think this is one of the toughest questions as part of decarbonisation. Um, you know, about 18 months ago, National Grid set out a, a vision for the future of heating, actually. We did it in the US because we've predominantly got more of our gas business in the US. Uh, and we did it because we sort of recognised that nobody was really talking about what the roadmap looks like. Um, and people do forget that three to four times more energy still goes through our gas network than goes through our electric network. So the let's electrify everything tomorrow is just practically and engineeringly not not doable, but also from an affordability perspective, you know, really prohibitive. So uh, when we think about the future of heat and the future of um, the future of gas, we think ultimately you're going to end up with a hybrid solution. So, I mean, first and foremost, there's still massive opportunity to reduce the amount of carbon impact through heating people's homes through energy efficiency. Um, you know, it is the most obvious thing to do, and there's still a huge opportunity to do that. But then we do see a role for things like heat pumps and geothermal. But we also think that there's an opportunity to, to reduce the carbon impact of natural gas so you can blend it with hydrogen. Mm -hmm. So you can put 20% hydrogen through your network today don't need to change any appliances, reduces the impact of, of gas being burned for heating. Uh, and similarly, things like renewable natural gas. So actually capturing renewable natural gas, um, the methane impact of that is hugely positive. Uh, so we see a sort of hybrid solution. So because ultimately customers will want choice and affordability is going to be different in different regions. So. Can you just explain renewable natural gas and what goes into it? Because I understand feedstocks. Yeah, so, it's, um, so it can be 
yeah, animal waste. It can be <laughs> sludge, uh, uh, water waste. Um, in fact, National Grid uh, a couple of weeks ago had a, a ribbon cutting ceremony in New York. So we've just opened up um, a new facility just on the, you can see it, uh, the Manhattan skyline where we're collecting wastewater from New York City. Uh, we're Incredible. putting it through a digester, uh, producing renewable natural gas, uh, and then injecting it directly into our distribution system. So um, um, the opportunity is there. I mean, most of the renewable natural gas comes from uh, landfill and waste uh, today. In fact, in the US, I think we've had 250 sites open in the last decade. So it's, you know, it's, it's growing quite significantly. So, you know, landfill waste is probably the predominant source of renewable natural gas, but uh, agricultural waste and potentially water waste are all our potential sources of it. Um, and we did a study in the US and there's plenty of it available. You just got to capture it in the right place and then inject it into the network. Uh, National Grid has repositioned uh, to focus more on electricity, now 70% of the group uh, than gas. Uh, so how do the remaining gas activities fit within the group, both from an environmental and a financial perspective? Yeah, so from our perspective, we, um, we as a board actually a couple of years ago sort of stood back and looked at the, the sort of how do we see the sort of the, the roadmap and the journey for, for the energy transition. And whichever way we looked at it, we, we came to the conclusion that electricity is going to be the dominant fuel. Um, it's got a long-term certain and strong future in terms of growth. But the gas has got an important role to play. So what we decided to do was to sort of adjust the shape of the group so that we were 70% electric and 30% gas. And actually, we're uh, predominantly electric in the UK now, but we're about 50-50 gas and electric in the US. Uh, and that's because when we think about our customers, we think about affordability, uh, we think that it is inevitable that gas will play a massively important role for, for decades to come. And actually, in the areas that we operate in the US, which are urban areas, downstate New York, it is very difficult to electrify or use heat pumps. Mm. And therefore, we think the gas network has got a very important role. And then it leads to, well, what can you do to mitigate the impacts so of things like injecting hydrogen, renewable natural gas reduces the carbon impact. Okay. Uh I want to go back to the connectors because we were talking about the connecting up things offshore. And I'm fascinated by this Viking link interconnector that connects the UK with Denmark, which is um, roughly about 760 odd kilometres long, uh, which is the longest subsea interconnector in the world. What's the aim of that project? So we have a number of interconnectors. I mean, this is the, the last one in, a, in a, a phase that we've been going through. So we've built out uh, interconnectors with France, with Belgium, with Holland, with Norway, and uh, the Viking interconnector is the last of this phase. Um, it's 1.4 gigawatts of energy that can be transported either from the UK to Denmark or Denmark to the UK. It is the longest subsea cable in the world. So it's an amazing engineering project. Uh, and the principle behind it is that actually uh, countries can support each other when there's a need and there's a price differential. So basically when there's a shortage in the UK, prices will go up and energy will flow from Denmark to the UK and vice versa. And actually, in a world where you've got intermittency as part of climate change, the more your networks are interconnected, the less vulnerable you are to sort of local weather patterns. So imagine a time when most of our energy is coming from wind in the UK, but you have a period of three or four days when it's still. Now, you can have storage, which will help, but actually being connected to Europe, either through Denmark or Norway or through France or Belgium, is going to help in those situations and vice versa. Mm. Uh, so, um, you know, we're really excited about them. They're, I think they're fantastic for security supply, but also fantastic for lowering the cost for consumers. And do you see having that, but the, more and more of these projects happening? Yeah, we do, but also they're starting to morph into something else. So, <laughs> you know, what's happening in the North Sea is that, um, so you have these sort of point-to-point -point connectors, as I call them, so one country just connecting to another. National Grid at the moment is looking at two projects where we connect into Belgium and Holland, but that the wind farms also connect in the North Sea into these interconnectors, which means that the wind farms now have a choice. Do they send the energy to Europe or do they send the, the energy to the UK? Oh. Up until now, all wind farms are either just connected to Europe or just connected to the UK. So uh, we call them multi-purpose interconnectors. So that's the next phase, if you like. So I think we will see more interconnectors, just like the ones we built, but we'll start to see wind farms interconnecting to them. And then ultimately, all of this will become a an integrated network offshore. 
And again, actually, out of the public side, this is all going on. It must be fascinating from an investor's point of view. Yeah, I think you know, particularly for multi-purpose interconnectors, you know, I think there's also the opportunity to create uh, energy islands. Yeah. And you know, we mentioned hydrogen earlier. You know, sort of, I'm I'm more cautious on the the opportunity or cost benefit of hydrogen in the heating sector. But you know, given we have all these offshore wind farms, and interconnectors will help with accommodating the intermittency of, of generation, you know, at times when there is excess uh, wind generation, having, uh, having an energy island with uh, hydrogen production facilities uh, creates a, a great opportunity. Yeah, absolutely. Um, last couple of questions. Uh, the nationalisation of utilities has taken a little bit of a back seat now. Uh, the Labour Party has removed it as uh, from their pledges, but there has been talk more broadly of a social purpose company for regulated utilities. Now, just to be clear, that's one where it, in its operating licence, there is a requirement to take a long-term view. Uh, the interests of current and future customers should be balanced. Vulnerable customers are protected and all stakeholders are taken account of. Um, what do you think of the concept of a social purpose company for regulated utilities? So I'm not hugely, you know, I'm not a huge fan of of um, government sort of imposing those sort of things on companies. I actually think that, you know, good performing companies, particularly in areas like National, that National Grid is dealing with, are doing that anyway. So when I became CEO at National Grid in 2016, we spent a huge amount of time saying, well, what does it mean to be a responsible business that's working in local communities? And actually what we produced was called our Responsible Business Charter, which basically sets out very clearly for everybody to see what we stand for as an organization, and what actions we're taking, not just to support the investment community, but also what we're doing in local communities, what we're doing to create jobs, what we're doing for the environment, and what we're doing to be a good corporate citizen in terms of governance. Uh, and we've laid that out and we've got actions in place. And we did that deliberately so that people can hold us to account because um, it is absolutely necessary that businesses like National Grid are profitable, but it's not sufficient. That's the only thing that they do. So I think it's more about companies standing up themselves and taking that responsibility. We can't build infrastructure in local communities unless we're a responsible business and we have a relationship and we recognize that they've got a voice. So we try and make sure that all our stakeholders are involved in those things. And we were speaking earlier, weren't we, uh, just about the ramp up in taking on graduates uh, into the business with the older generation uh, retiring. I mean, demographics is playing a role in that as well. Yeah, absolutely. So one of our challenges, I mean, it's a fantastic opportunity if you're in the industry. One of our challenges is that, you know, we're going to see this, you know, multiple increase in the volume of work that we need to deliver uh, at a time when technology is changing as well. So it's quite exciting. We're not just rebuilding the system that we built 50 years ago. We're building a new system. But at the same time, you know, the the utility sector is a sector in where there are large swathes of people are going to be retiring over the next decade. So we, we're losing all this experience on the one hand, which is a challenge, but we've got these fantastic opportunities. So that means... Uh, you know, if you're a graduate or an apprentice, an apprentice, there's just a fantastic opportunity waiting for you. Okay, I just want to finish with one final question, a little peek into the future. Uh, National Grid um, Partners is the corporate venture of the uh, capital group within the business, uh, and it's made over 40 investments in technology companies uh, from batteries to AI. But I want to ask you, which developing technology do you think is the most exciting or promising for the energy sector? Yeah, well, we set up National Grid Partners because... What I was trying to do with it is I wanted to have um, visibility of what technology is coming over the hill that could impact on networks tomorrow and actually work with startup companies so we sort of we can help them be successful because they really want to use our network to do that, but we get an insight into those technologies that are going to help us to deliver for customers and investors going forward. And I think generative AI is the thing I'm probably most excited about, <laughs> most CEOs are at the moment, I suspect, because the potential application of it is huge. So I had my team come in to see my executive uh, three or four weeks ago, and they just did some demonstrations on the power of it. So in terms of you know being able to analyze large data sets to be able to do better predictive maintenance rather than time cycle maintenance, being able to analyze what's going on in the network to optimize the flows on the network, uh, you know the capability is so huge. Uh, to improve the way that we do customer satisfaction and customer service with our call centers. It's got multiple applications. So, um, yeah, we're quite excited about it. And, our, you know, our National Grid Partners business looks out and seeks out those startup companies that are looking at those niche areas. We help them to sort of develop, but then we learn from it and then we apply it. So of those 40 companies, probably 20 or 30 of them 
have now got their software or their applications in National Grid, uh, and not just in one part of our business in the US and in the UK. So it's helping us to run the networks. So I'm quite excited about it. Yeah, and actually for you, those sorts of technologies must be quite exciting. Yeah, what, and, and also it's great that National Grid can effectively accelerate the deployment of those uh, of those technologies. Um, but uh, you know, given the scale of the investment required, you know, technologies that can potentially use the existing grid more efficiently, you know, is is a win win for uh, uh, all stakeholders. Yeah. How close is that bringing that AI on board? coming over that hill is it still on the coming up the upslope or the generative ai yeah, yeah. is just you know i think um everybody's trying to get their arms around how do you do it in a safe and protected way yeah. so i mean to blunt that's the first and foremost thing we started to think about was okay so this is fantastic technology but we have access to data that yeah. in the wrong hands would be very valuable so how do we make sure that we can make use of that uh, that technology but do it in a safe and protected way from things like cyber attacks. So, um, so that was the first thought. Um, but now that we've got through that and we're partnering with some technology companies, we're starting to think about, okay, what are the user cases? What are the applications? But AI has been something that's been part of National Grid now for a number of years. So, um, you know, it is helping us run the system today. It's helping us keep the lights on and it's helping us with things like maintenance. So. Well, John Pettigrew, thank you so much for joining us and good luck with rewiring the economy. Thank you very much. Thanks a lot. Thank Actually, you, John. thank you. Thank you.